Welcome to the series Healing with the Enneagram. I'm Samantha Mackay, Enneagram 7 and Certified Unconventional Life Coach. I work with people who are stressed from trying to live by others' rules, a kind of stress that often contributes to exhaustion, burnout, and physical illness. I found the Enneagram an incredibly helpful tool for guiding my clients through the healing and growth that's necessary to craft a life on their own terms, reconnected to their essence. But it feels to me that Growing with the Enneagram is better understood than healing with the Enneagram, which is why I wanted to chat with a range of practitioners about how they practically incorporate the Enneagram into their work. In this interview, I chat with Carrie Luter about how she uses the Enneagram to help clients heal disordered eating. We discuss why that matters, look at three case studies, one from each center of intelligence, in a conversation that's practical and insightful for clinicians and patients alike. Let's dive in. Hello and welcome to the series on healing with the Enneagram. I'm Samantha Mackay and today I'm talking with Carrie Luter about the Enneagram and eating disorders. Thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so I'm a registered dietitian and a licensed clinical social worker and I have been using the Enneagram as a tool and I have been finding fascinating and interesting overlaps with psychotherapy approaches and also just more effective and efficient ways to get to the heart of what is motivating a person around their eating disorder. And and it really does inform how I'm going to recommend treatment for them. So it's been really exciting to have the Enneagram be a part of my clinical toolbox. How did you start working with eating disorders in the first place? You mentioned you were a dietitian. Is that sort of what you intended or did it sort of just emerge out of your work? Yeah, so I became a dietitian first and I wanted to work in the area of sports nutrition and it became very clear there was a lot of people struggling with dysfunctional eating and doing some very regimented and difficult things with food and I didn't know exactly what to do with that. And so I got extra training as a dietitian And I really am psychologically minded and I wanted to go back to school and figure out how I could also work clinically on the psychological, psychotherapeutic aspect of helping people who are struggling with food in their bodies. I can imagine that sport is a place where there's extra confusion about how to eat in the right way. You use the word dysfunctional eating. And so I'm wondering what's the difference between like dysfunctional eating, disordered eating, and maybe just eating as a coping mechanism. You can kind of think of it as a spectrum. And at the root of dysfunctional or clinically kind of formal eating disorders is a restrictive mindset, a scarcity mindset that someone has gotten themselves into. And it really is about restricting and trying to control in some way, shape, or form, because they're not a happy person on some level. And I want to quote one of the famous first early psychiatrists in the early 19th century, Hilde Bruch. She is a German physician that came over to the U.S. in the 1930s. And she says, the misuse of eating is an attempt to solve or camouflage problems of daily living that seem otherwise insolvable. That feels really true. And so I'm curious then, at what point does someone acknowledge that they need support for an eating disorder? Because if we're all using food as a coping mechanism in some way, and I know that that's part of almost our training as being humans, because as babies, food, milk is used to help us soothe and and as part of that self-soothing piece. So Yeah. When do we know that it's something we need help with? Yeah. Basically, if you are adopting ritualistic eating behaviors, habits, rules that begin to rule you instead of you feeling free and at peace with food, that's an indicator. If you're refusing to eat with others socially because you're embarrassed about Um, eating in front of them or ashamed in some way of how you eat or what you eat, that's a problem. If you're struggling to engage with food in any way, shape, or form that is positive, if it starts to become overwhelmingly pressured or daunting or you hate it, that's an issue. 
if you are moving your body to try to burn off calories or control how your body looks because you're worried about what the food you're eating is doing to your body, that's an issue. If you are hoarding food or stashing food, um, that can be a telltale sign that you're in trouble. If you have lowered self-esteem, especially around thinking about how you look or how you eat, that's an issue. And then if obviously the eating, the clinical eating disorders is where we start to see the breakdown of a person being able to be well nourished and having medical complications. So if you've got some medical issues that are happening, and that could be anywhere from if you're vomiting and your teeth are decaying because the acid is eroding your teeth and your dentist tells you what's going on with your teeth, it could look like that. It could look like stomach issues. There's a whole array of um, symptoms that are medical complications of problems with food. And I think the thing I think is coming to mind is the difference between overeating and undereating. I assume that that's sort of the the two different ways we can control food and using this controlling mechanism. I'm wondering if there's still like if, the, if there's more shame associated with binge eating now than with undereating because it almost feels like undereating has become more commonly spoken about in society and more acceptable at getting treatment. I don't I'm just curious about the difference. It's individual. Every person I've ever worked with, whether they have anorexia nervosa or a binge eating disorder or bulimia nervosa or ARFA, there's a lot of shame and embarrassment with any of them. Now, in terms of societal viewpoints, absolutely people joke, even with me knowing I'm an eating disorder therapists and dietitians are like, oh, I wish I had anorexia. <laughs> so I think it is much more um, accepted to be, you know, thin and endeavoring to not eat very much. And it's a very warped and toxic viewpoint. And it, it speaks to our prevalence of diet culture and how damaging it is. But at the root of every eating disorder is a restriction. It's a trying to withhold food on purpose. It's just some people have the perfect genetic storm to be able to restrict and go into that anorexia mode, whereas some people can't do it. They can't tolerate it. And biologically, they overcompensate. Like most of us, have you ever gone, you know, over six hours without eating? And the next time you eat, you're like, you do, you overdo it because you're so ravenously hungry. I mean, that's just a biological drive in all of us. So at the root core, yeah, it's restriction it's, regardless, even though you think yeah. with binge eating, it's not about restriction. It starts with a restriction. I want to lose weight. I want to eat less. I want to not Why? eat as much food, just like with anorexia. So there are different diagnostic criteria, but at the root of it all, it starts with dieting. It starts with under eating, those mm -hmm. efforts to not eat enough. Yeah, that's really, really interesting. And so I'm curious, what role does the Enneagram play in helping someone move out of an eating disorder? And I suppose... The, the preemptive question is, is what does it mean to heal an eating disorder? Is it something that you sort of treat and, and are constantly managing? Like what is the ideal outcome? So for first of all, the ideal treatment people need to be aware of, it is a wraparound approach. And there are several important people that need to be on your team to help you. And it includes a dietitian a registered dietitian in the United States is what we're called. And then it includes a licensed therapist that can look like different titles, but it also includes a medical professional, a medical doctor that could be a psychiatrist. You could have a psychiatrist and your own, you know, individual physician. However, these people need to have had extra training in eating disorders because we don't get it baseline in our training. And so you need to 
make sure they have had extra training. And some people try to get away with only having a therapist. Some people try to get away with only having a doctor. But you really need to have that whole team that's the gold standard for treating eating disorders. And so I want to make sure that to answer your question thoroughly, you need to understand there are essentially four components of treating an eating disorder. It's a biopsychosocial model. And so there's biology involved in mm-hmm. eating disorders. There's psychological, individual psychological trauma or stress involved. And then there's the social component, like we spoke about the diet culture, the, the, this notion that a large body is a lesser than body. It's devalued. Mm. It has less dignity. It has less humanness. So everybody's endeavoring to be valued and feel worthwhile in society and not be ostracized or shamed. And so they're trying to control that aspect of socialness Mm. around eating and what they look like. Right. That's, I mean, I love that model, the bio, so psycho, social, and that it sort of really explains why you need a team. It's not something you can do on your own or do with fun people because it is a multidimensional complex problem. Very complicated. And where I, I can get on a soapbox about treatment, I think our field does its best, but I think we try to cookie cut treatment too much. And I've had the pleasure and luxury of being an outpatient practitioner, and I get to treat people as individuals. I get to hear the individual story and the journey, and it really does require taking that individual narrative approach, much like the Enneagram, you know, just Mm -hmm. what is happening specifically inside this person's experience, their family of origin, what has their journey been with that, what trauma, stress has been there, and what are they bringing to the table that we need to look at each individual and and instincts actually play a role as well. So. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons I love the Enneagram because it does allow us to individuate and and almost approach someone as a unique person because it gives us patterns to look for. Exactly. Yeah. It it really does. It's a client-centered approach and tailors to their needs and everybody has different needs. Yeah. So maybe this is a good time to jump in into the Enneagram. Do you want to start with a case study or to go to start with something broader and how you use it? Yeah, the first thing I'd like to address is how the Enneagram helps the helpers, clinicians who work with eating disorders. Um, And then I can get into how I've seen the clients being helped with the Enneagram. Mm. So... This is where I'm passionate is to help other clinicians use the Enneagram as a tool because it helps our diagnostic acuity. We can quickly see people's different motivations, coping strategies, and relationship pattern. It guides our treatment plan and it gives our best foot forward for that to have confidence in how to time our treatment and and the sequence of our interventions. It helps us develop accurate understanding of the client's worldview and establishing rapport is so key when we're working with somebody with an eating disorder to build trust and have greater speed with greater precision. And defense mechanisms, you know, can look so different. And so as a clinician, it helps me to hone in on okay, I I know what's coming at me and provide the client with reliable ways to transform the suffering they're in and help them be more objective about themselves around their defense mechanisms and patterns. It's a, the Enneagram is a strengths-based perspective, which aligns with most therapist training as we don't want to pathologize a person and dehumanize them and shame them to help them feel better. That doesn't work. (laughs) And so the Enneagram depathologizes and just matter of factly says, hey, this is just how kind of you're built. This is what we're looking at. 
and it provides a very fluid system to understand personality patterns. And then if a therapist is interested in bringing in spirituality, as we know, the Enneagram is the psycho-spiritual model, so you can actually enhance your treatment for those who are interested in providing a larger transpersonal framework by helping the client recognize their gifts and help them mature their, their deep essence spiritually. So for those reasons, I really feel like it dovetails nicely in the clinical world. So I can see how on the one hand, you can use it to figure out which part of the treatment to put first. Like I find yeah. that with my clients, you know, do we need to do emotional work, s somatic work or mental work for what's coming up in this moment? And that constantly changes. You're constantly adapting based on the person and, and what's coming up. On the other hand, I could see how it would be necessary for people to be reminded of their strengths and yes. reminded of their essence and to feel like they've got something positive to move towards while they're going through all this suffering and difficulty because it's so easy to lose sight of those strengths. And yes, those strengths are also our weaknesses. They're undermining us in some way, but that doesn't mean they're not there to serve as strengths or the positive side of ourselves that we've forgotten. Exactly. And it's about unlearning what culture has told us about ourselves and how we should be and about remembering our essence and the gifts that we bring inherently as being ourselves. Yeah, I think that's really useful for clinicians to know. And so what about clients? Like what it's like on the client side with the Enneagram? Yeah, so I began incorporating work with the Enneagram about three and a half years ago now. One of my first clients is a self pros nine. And I knew with a nine, you don't want to put your agenda on them and you really want to invite them for their input and help them kind of take their time coming up with a process that makes sense to them in the treatment. So that was super helpful because otherwise as a two clinician, I'm all in their business and like, I gotcha. Here's, here's the 50 things that we need to do and go check them off and go do your homework. So I really had to learn to relax and, and, and give some space and time to that process for the nine and have patience. And so understanding that the self pres nine that I worked with was essentially used to being a wallflower and erasing herself and not promoting herself as appropriately important. I knew that she had struggles with boundary setting. I knew that she was not in touch with her anger. And so I knew those were some of my treatment areas of focus. And so I really was able to help educate her about anger. I really was able to kind of ease into her challenging her ego. And so it was a beautiful thing. I utilized a model with her called eating competence where she basically experientially was learning how to be with food. And so it was a very beautiful nurturing of her autonomy with her body and with food. And so it really was so amazing to see it work with the Enneagram, you know, instead of me doing some other things that I might have usually done. I changed a little bit how I did it and it unfolded beautifully. She went from being extremely underweight to being able to maintain a weight range. She, she, it's hard, you know, she complains about and is irritated that she has to think about putting herself in the picture and have structured eating every day. <laughs> But she can appreciate, we kind of use spirituality of like, aren't, aren't we in awe of the body and the gift of being here? And don't we want to really respect ourselves and this gift we've been given 
to nurture ourselves with food and be present with food. So it's been a really cool thing to see. I find that fascinating. The thing with nines I've always found is that, you know, we think we need to speed them up, but if you just slow yourself down and go at yeah. their pace, they speed yeah. up. Otherwise that passive resistance kicks in and it sort of undermines the whole process. And yeah. Then you're having to address a whole different dynamic that gets in the way of really getting to the heart of them being safe and empowered and strong and putting themselves in an appropriate balance of being present in life, engaged in life and putting their needs where they need to be. You mentioned uh, the eating competence model. I think, what what's that? Yeah. So this is a, a model I've been trained in in 2017. It's Ellen Satter, who's a dietitian and a licensed marriage family therapist. And she developed this model in the 80s. And it essentially has four pillars. And I'm going to look at my handout to make sure I get it right so everybody understands what they are. One of the pillars is called eating attitude. Are you positive about eating? Are you positive about the fact that you're positive about eating? Because, you know, you'll hear people sometimes say, oh, I love food, but I love it too much. You know, like it's a bad thing. And another pillar are food acceptance skills. Are you comfortable with your preferred foods? And do you have skills for learning how to like unfamiliar foods or foods that maybe you didn't like as a kid. Can you stay calm and maybe try it instead of, you know, always being like, absolutely not. And so some people don't accept the fact that they love ice cream or that they love a Twinkie. It's really being able to just matter of factly say, yeah, I, I like food and these are the foods that I like. Another pillar is internal regulation skills, and this is where a person can depend on their own internal experience of hunger, satiation, appetite, and fullness. And that is what guides you to determine how much you eat, not external rules, not anything outside of you, really paying attention to your own wisdom with your body. And then the last pillar is contextual skills. Can you make meals a priority for yourself? Do you have skills and resources for managing food? So for with the nine, you know, they forget themselves. And I assessed, I assess all my clients in these areas and she really needed help with her contextual skills. She would forget to have lunch all the time. <laughs> And I had to say, now, how can we go about making this a process where you can get that ball rolling every day? You know, initially, let's aim for maybe once or twice a week where we add that lunch back in. What do you think would make sense um, in how to get that system going? Because they're so process oriented. Uh, so those were some of the ways that I was able to incorporate those four pillars of eating competence. And so she's really, really flourished. And we've been able to manage her symptoms. She, she truly is a competent eater now. And we're able to do a lot more deeper Enneagram work now that her eating disorder symptoms are kind of behind. Yeah, I like that, that model. Those four things I think are really important to think about. And the thing yeah. that struck me is I think sometimes it's about accepting the foods we like but also accepting the foods we don't like. Because I know I sometimes spend a lot of time eating things I don't like for various oh, reasons, you know? Yeah, food pressure happens in childhood. Oftentimes that's where it starts, but also the external rules of here's what you should eat, here's yeah. what you should not eat. So yeah, absolutely accepting that you don't have to eat the foods you don't find pleasurable. The model emphasizes two things, and they must both be present. One, always prioritize what you find pleasurable and enjoyable, 
because feeding yourself day in and day out is a labor of love. It sometimes is like, us. I don't want to do it anymore. You know, cooking and all of it. And so it ha- the juice has to be worth the squeeze. It's hard. And so why would you make it more hard to be eating food you don't find enjoyable? No, you got to have that component. Always be looking for things that at least are neutral, you know, if not wonderful to you. And then the second piece is to pay attention while you're eating. Be present. The Enneagram teaches this, that, you know, raising our levels of awareness, being conscious and being present as a practice is, is integrated with the Enneagram. So I love, again, how the Enneagram shows up all over the place. Cute. It's so, it aligns beautifully with those two components of really having the gift of, wow, we get to be here on this earth while it's hard at times. There's beautiful things and lovely experiences we get to have. Why not do that with food day in and day out? Yeah, and it's a shame that food has gotten so twisted in all these different ways by this, the society and the rule, you know, all that sort of that piece in there. Yeah, the ego's kind of got in the way and kind of wrecked it all. (laughs) <laughs> For those, you know, ones who kind of uh, got overkill, we're like, no, we got to have these rules, you know, and some of the twos, threes, and fours who are about the image, you know, went a little overkill and said, oh, we don't like how that looks if the body looks like that, you know? So yeah, our egos kind of took over and wrecked our trust in the awe and and the wonderment of the human body and the experience mm. we get to have. I'm curious, you shared this beautiful story about a nine. What about the other centers, the, uh, the heart center and the uh, head center? So let's see. I can think about a three and she was a self promised three, actually, now that I think about it. She was a she just got out of college and so she just started her career and she was a runner and her dad was a very um involved runner and so she and her dad were thick and they would run together but she took it to an extreme and so she made it a success project and she really didn't recognize when it was becoming too much for her body physically and then she got the social accolades for like how she looked and how amazing she was for being able to accomplish marathons you know and and beat her record every time and her dad was giving her all of the you know congratulatory attention and so she was on top of the world but her medical health became really poor and she denied it at first she didn't want to acknowledge that it was an issue she's like what are you talking about you know Mm -hmm. runners are healthy (laughs) and so we really began to work with the Enneagram and and I got to really teach her about how her ego worked and she was pretty resistant at First, it was hard for her ego to to hear some of those things, but then it began began to kind of click of like, oh yeah, I don't. I'm not the kind of person that really likes the accolades. I like it when my dad says it, but I don't want the attention. You know, I'm not I'm not after the medal or anything like that. I'm just doing my own thing, and so it was a really lovely journey to to be with her. And to help her raise awareness around what her, not knowing her her true authentic self, she was doing it for other people, you know, she was trying to be a chameleon to please other people and be successful to other people. And so there were some interesting conversations around who is she as an individual in her value system and what she desires apart from her dad. And apart from, you know, the people that mean a lot to her. And so that was an important journey that she took. Mm-hmm. It's so tricky for threes with that social image feedback 
affirmation piece to start, yeah. especially when you're getting it so easily. Well, not easily, exactly. but you know, it's readily available. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll say that, isn't it said that the U.S. is a, is a three kind of state pro- or a three place? And, and so it is just everywhere. And it's just like, push yourself, you know, work hard and you'll get, you know, the things you deserve. And so it's kind of punishing. It goes, it goes to extremes. And so it's really hard, I think, for threes to say, wait a minute, something's not healthy about this for me. (laughs) And it sounds like she wasn't the one who almost initiated the treatment. Like it was, it was something else that brought her in because her ego wasn't ready for the shock of it. Yes. And that's helped me as a clinician because I've always been like, why did it take some people so long to get help with an eating disorder? And they're suffering so badly. Their hair is falling out. They've got, you know, their bones are disintegrating, literally. They've got, you know, fractures all the time. But anyway, yes, it's kind of this punishing i'm not going to pay attention to you know what's happening or what i'm feeling threes can very much compartmentalize and and just focus on you know the eye on the prize of like this is how i feel good is when i feel like i've checked you know gotten my to-do list done and and i'm doing all the things by being healthy by you know eating fewer calories and running uber mild this is the this is the way to be successful this is what you know our society tells us and so it's really hard to help and retrain their focus and say there's more there's more to life here <laughs> mm-hmm. i'm glad that you had that tool to be able to work with her in that way and then what about the the head types someone from the head center yeah, so I a seven comes to mind, and I hypothesized she was likely a self pres seven, and she came to me at the age of seventeen. Her mom was concerned about her low self esteem, and just kind of dabbling a little bit in not nourishing herself enough, and her mom wondered if. You know, she was trying to diet and and control her body to help her feel better about herself. Mm-hmm. I think this client had been homeschooled and she was engaging in a social aspect that was new to her with boys. And she knew that she was going to be going off to college. And I think that was a little daunting for her. A little fearful of what is that going to be like and how am I going to manage through that when when my network of people that I've built up here won't be there. And so she really didn't have a full-on clinical eating disorder. And had I not known the Enneagram, I probably would have mistakenly thought she did. But because I understood the fear and I understood the anxiety that's hovering underneath, especially for the self presence, I was able to say, no, I don't think that she truly is wanting to focus on doing everything she can to uh, be thin and control her body. I think she's trying to control her anxiety and her low self-esteem and And what's the world going to be like? Is it going to be safe for me when things change drastically? She's very charming, very funny. It was hard to keep her focus in session, light of ideas everywhere. And so that was one thing as a clinician, I had to bring her back to speaking about difficult things. Like when I started probing about, I noticed you got tears when you spoke about this thing. What is, tell me a little bit about that. And she would not want to spend too much time with that. And I had to really respect, let's talk about something fun first. Then we'll do a short limited discussion about this. And then we'll talk about more fun things, you know? So I had to kind of work with that. So yeah, the Enneagram helped me to 
think about how to work with the client and then also help me discern what really was going on with them and and not really push any more than I needed to about exploring or or assuming there was a, a deeper seated eating disorder going on. Mm -hmm. It's so tricky for sevens because of, because of that happy persona. Clinicians can struggle to even see that there's a problem at all. I hear stories about sevens being turned away from therapy because they're like, oh, you don't, you're fine. You've got, there's no problem yeah. there. And so I think, you know, for each type, it's useful to be able to see beyond the facade because there is always real pain there for people. But it's understanding what is that pain and, and what's going on with it. And yeah, I love how you talked about being able to adapt for this person and how they were presenting. And it's so particularly important. And I think this is what the Enneagram offers for every type, especially for a, you know, a practitioner to a client, that you can help calm the ego so you can do the work you need to do. You know, for sevens, yes. you help calm the ego with some laughter and some jokes and some fun or whatever it is, you know, for that person. And then you're like, okay, let's, okay, look, just two seconds of the hard stuff. And then we'll, yeah. do it. we'll go back, you know, and with time, the capacity yeah. for the hard stuff increases, but you've got to find the right capacity for each person in that moment. Precisely. Yeah. It really helps target what's going to be helpful for their growth. And I knew she was going off to college and I really wanted to make sure I gave her some very practical ways that she continued her growth and so we would do like some playful scenario it was okay you're at college and you're in these weird new classes and your anxiety is coming up how do you talk to people how do you get yourself through that fear and how do you like when you and your boyfriend are distanced and you're starting to have some feelings how do you really honor those feelings and sit through them and not just go distract yourself with something fun you know I was able to I felt like help her to continue to grow and understand what her ego would be pulling her to do but that what she really needed to be doing to flourish in life yeah so interesting it's such a useful tool I really Love the Enneagram. It's great to hear how you're able to use it in these different ways with clients and how clinicians can use it for different ways with clients too. So that's, that's great. Thank you for sharing all of it. It's been Oh, you're fantastic. welcome. I hope it helps somebody to be inspired or to understand the beauty of the Enneagram with oh. eating and, and, and allowing for a beautiful growth with their ego as well as the relationship with food.